when people ask when did you first um, join the area or want to join the area, when I read books about the, how the Irish Republic achieved its freedom from Britain by violence, by, by IRA violence, by a lot of self-sacrifice, by a lot of patriots, and I felt, I always felt that I was, uh, that I admired these people and those days and wanted to be part of it. This is the story of what has happened to one Catholic family in Northern Ireland in the 20 years since the Troubles began. There were five boys in the O'Doherty family, and for the most part it's the story of how the family was torn apart when one of them joined the IRA. But back in 69, when their father was teaching at the local primary school, all that was still to come. Your husband, Barney, was he keen on the children's education because he was a well, teacher? Very strict about their education. Very strict. It came first. All their homework done before they went out to play. Was he a strict father? He was pretty strict, but fair. Strict, but fair. Were you a strict mother? No. I would uh, break down. When I'd make laws, I could break them for them. The O'Doherty's were a middle-class family who lived in a Georgian house in a middle-class area of Londonderry, Clarendon Street. Most of their neighbours were Protestants. They were a very closely attached family. It was dreadful, you know, all the things that happened. Were they happy days in Clarendon Street? Of course they were, very happy days. I wish they were all back again once more. But that can't be. All the boys attended the Christian Brothers Primary School where their father taught. Fergal was the youngest. We were in a, a Catholic school which uh, at, at once would say things like, well, we're pacifists and uh, we, we believe in, uh, in the laws of God and so on and so forth. However, at the same time, we would be reading Irish history, uh, which if anyone reads enough Irish history would realize that um, a lot of the goals of what people had been doing in, say, 1916, 1922 had not been, quote, fulfilled. Christian brothers filled the younger Doherty's with stories of how Ireland had achieved independence from Britain through the sacrifices of the Irish Republican Army. To teachers in the Christian Brothers School, the IRA's first leaders were the fathers of the nation, and no heroics stirred the classroom more than the martyrdom of the leaders of the 1916 Easter Rising. All the Doherty boys were brought up on this romantic diet of Irish history but one of them, Shane Paul, was completely carried away. If you read about the 1916 Rising, there is a tremendous romance about it, and I was caught up in that romance. I felt nothing could be more glorious or exciting or beautiful or fulfilling. The whole meaning of life could be contained in that fight for Irish freedom, you might say, recreation of, a, of, of an Easter Rising, perhaps, in Northern Ireland, and a death as a martyr and hero and eternal memory, uh, you know, an eternal place in the memory of the Irish people thereafter, that impressed me a lot. They wrote a note um, at the age of nine years old, co um, committing himself to the cause of Irish republicanism. And they wrote this letter and sort of hid it in the floorboards of the house, upstairs in the attic. It was sort of like his, uh, almost like a curriculum vitae for the future. <laughs> Put a date on it, name on it, address on it, so I want to grow up, become a, a member of the IRA. A, a martyr for Ireland, that type of thing. And signed it, and left it there. At one point, Nelson's column, I think, was blown up on Dublin when I was quite young. I was brilliantly impressed by the use of jelly night, and um, lots of people, used, lots of students came back to Derry with alleged pieces of the statue. And it was, uh, that was an insight into the possibility that the IRA existed and could be active. The Adoherty's grew up in Derry. For generations, the Protestant minority who ran the city had discriminated against the Catholic majority who lived there. Most Catholics lived in the area known as the Bogside, 
The Adoherties lived just beyond, and although they were better off, felt discrimination just like their poorer neighbours. The majority of the people in our neighbourhood were Protestant, so that was always in the forefront. Again, the person that we went to the grocery store in, Mr Craig, was Protestant and was held in great suspicion by my father, who would say, that son of a bitch put a halfpenny on every damn item and he thinks we don't notice it. So there was always that suspicion in the backdrop of our family towards Protestants. I always had a feeling of being a, an inferior creature and that being a Catholic meant that my possibilities of getting a job afterwards were very small and the possibility of me getting a house, say, if I wanted to get a council house or whatever afterwards was small. I was aware that as a group we were discriminated against and that all the advantages accrued to Protestants. In 1968, the emotions of thousands of Catholics who felt second-class citizens exploded in the civil rights movement. The authorities were determined to contain what they saw as a Catholic uprising orchestrated by the IRA. It wasn't the first time the Adoherties had seen Catholic skulls cracked by the mainly Protestant police. It was hell, because they used to come out and beat the hell out of those old men and boys and children. And I remember seeing one man laying in front of me, bleeding on the head, and I said, I don't need this. I want to be away from this place. I can't stand this. The police tried to force their way into the bogside, which was the seat of Catholic resistance. The rioters would not let them pass. Well, if you can imagine the Bogside area, uh, area under siege and fierce rioting at the fringes of the Bogside to keep the police and other mobs out of the Bogside. If you can imagine those going on literally for days and nights, thousands of canisters of gas being fired, thousands of petrol bombs being fired, I was right in the front line as often as possible. I remember Barney going out to school and coming in with a dreadful gas. And then CS sending gas. the children home when it really got bad. He used to send the children all home and see them home, call their parents to come pick them up. You know, when the riots were gone. That was dreadful. 20 years ago, on the 14th of August, 1969, British troops arrived to restore order. The whole Catholic community was delighted to see the army come in initially. They were British, English. They seemed to be non-sectarian, certainly. Um, they seemed to be independent, and we were delighted to see them arrive. And they produced security on the streets overnight. And I remember, on frequent occasions, making banana sandwiches and taking flasks of coffee down to the troops at the foot of Clarence Street or the foot of Sackville Street or the foot of Great James Street, and um, giving them the sandwiches and coffee and running messages for them for cigarettes. But the honeymoon did not last. In the wake of fresh violence, the soldiers became as unwelcome as the police, at least to many young Catholics of the bog side. The provisionals were now ready in the wings to exploit the growing ill feeling. A lot of people my age would have been looking to join the provisionals, but I could never find anybody who was remotely associated with the provisional IRA until the day I met two, two school friends who said they were going to join. They took me to a, a flat. Did you hesitate about going with them? Not in the least. I, well, I'd grown up with one of them in particular. And uh, I was delighted at last to have discovered the real provisional IRA. Um, went along to a flat that evening, explained the family, um, who I was, and backed it up with information about the family. These people knew my father was a teacher in the Christian Brothers School, and uh, assumed, therefore, that I was OK. So they swore us in that very evening. No preliminaries. They swore us into. We took the oath of allegiance to the IRA that very evening. What did the swearing in involve? <laughs> well, the other two had to leave the room so that they could never give evidence that they'd actually seen me being sworn in. And two members of the IRA administered the oath, and I stood with hand, right hand up and swore to God and to uh, anybody else who was listening that I would take all orders from the IRA and dedicate myself to the IRA. That was it. So from that evening on, we were members of the IRA, but. For me, it was probably the most brilliant moment of my existence uh, up to then because uh, 
I found a terrible beauty. And uh, from that day forth, my whole life and existence changed. I wasn't an ordinary schoolboy. I had the cover of the St. Columns College uniform, but every day I was a secret agent of the IRA. That's what I felt. Did it make you feel big? Well, it made me feel great. I mean, uh, I had, you could say, my television camera going on in my own imagination. I was a central actor. I was a central player from then on. I first proved myself to the brigade staff in Derry when they were unable to plant a bomb somewhere and happened to dump it at my house and asked me to hide it. I planted it at a later date. Did you leave the bomb in the house? Oh, yes. Yeah. Well, I left it uh, adjacent to the house. Did it go? Yes. Of course not, yeah. And what damage did it do? Well, it did a fair bit of damage. Anybody hurt? Killed? No, nobody hurt or killed. It was against uh, a place rather than a person. And from that day forth, they said, here is somebody who will operate. Uh, so I, every time they, every time an opportunity came up to plant a bomb or make a bomb or plant it anywhere, I obviously took, I tried to be centrally involved. I annoyed the, the brigade staff time and time again to be more centrally involved. I was always volunteering for operations. Dozens of teenagers like Shane Paula Doherty took the oath and crossed the border to train. I had been away at a secret IRA training camp one weekend and I had told my family that I was going simply to Dublin for a weekend of student type activity at the age of 15 or 16. My father happened to be up in the attic, which was Shane's room, and he came across a, an amount of chemicals. So um, he came down and asked me, come up and see this, please, will you? So I went up and we found two and a half litres of sulfuric acid, uh, about a stone of potassium uh, chlor chlorate, and about the same amount of granulated sugar, and an amazing amount of condoms, you see. And my father said, what's all this about, you know? So, you know, I've told you, I mean, you, you know I teach a bit of chemistry, you see. And I thought to myself, now, wait a minute, potassium chlorate, sugar and sulfuric acid. Wow, we've got an incendiary mixture here. This is, this is very bad. Uh, and then later I realised the condoms were for purposes of timing the thing to, so that it could go off later, you see. So I said, my God, he must be involved in a paramilitary organisation, you see. So that was the first time we got, you know, positive and pr uh, proof positive that he was involved with the IRA, shall we say, yes. And you're standing there in the attic. You yes. realise that your brother is involved in the IRA. Yes. How do you react? My father and I, horror, because it wasn't in our philosophy that a member of the family should be in the IRA. It, it just didn't make sense, you see. But there was the evidence. So the first thing to do to protect the family was to get the evidence out. Nobody stopped you, no army patrols? Well, there were army patrols, but we did it in such a way, uh, kind of, uh, okay. if you remember the, the, the wooden horse film. So we worked out a system of hand signals and semaphores to get the stuff out of the house, down the street, across the Strand Road, and onto the quay, where we dropped it surreptitiously into the overfoil. Without causing vast amounts of ecological difficulty, but at least we had got rid of it out of the house, you see. Why didn't you go to the police? Well, again, we, it would, we would have put Shane and straight into prison. And who knows but what they would have pinned on, on the family as well. My father was dead against it. And he was he, Lord of Mercy, and was the head of the household, you see. So we didn't. And head of the school as well. And head of the school, that's right. Did you find anything else in the attic besides the bomb-making um, equipment? Well, we, we went through it very carefully then, and we found... We collected near enough to 100 rounds of live ammunition in the room, and we did the sa the, a similar thing. We, we dumped it in the river. I mean, when I came back from the training camp, I walked into the house and found my mother in some state, and I didn't realise what it was all about, so I was denying everything. Then she said, look, bullets have been found behind your pillow. Your brothers have taken them down and dropped them in the foil. What are you engaged in? The only worry that I had at the time was explaining to the IRA how the bullets had been lost. Well, after we had done this, I was in, in need of a jar, as we say. I went off with my friends and had a, had a couple of pints to recover from all this. So I wasn't in, in the house when Shane came back in. I remember I was in the living room and uh, my father was talking to Shane in the kitchen. And I heard voices raised. And within a few hours, Shane was packing his bags and was out of the house. And uh, he never returned to the house. I felt absolutely shattered.
when we did this cupboard. Had you any idea, any suspicion? None, whatever. How would I? From the way he acted? Mm, no. Anything he said? No way. And nothing he ever said. He came home each day from the college, did his work. Went normally about it. I couldn't. There was nothing to make me suspicious. He was just like the other, you know, he was like the other lad. His boyfriends called for him, they went out oh, right walking as we thought, you know, or to their football or whatever, but Yeah, no, no. There's nothing to make me suspicious. At all. But here's a boy from a good family, good education, living in a middle class area. How does he get involved in the IRA? You tell me that, Peter. You tell me that. That's some que that's a question I still won't answer. One of the problems with joining paramilitary organizations or being a part of paramilitary organizations, particularly when you're very young, is that from word go you you engage in the art of deception and you become expert at it. You deceive family, friends, school, you name it. Everybody's deceived, everybody is used. Though still at school, Shane Paul left home and joined the IRA on the streets of the Bogside. Although in theory one should be a secret member of the IRA, a secret agent of the IRA, in practice it was nice if some people knew because a bit of admiration from those people. So it was an ego trip and it was very fulfilling. It was, I mean, you could almost be a live hero or a live martyr if they realised you were in the IRA before you were dead. I remember on one occasion, while there was a riot going on, I discharged some shots in the direction of soldiers. And they were most amazed when I stepped around the corner and fired shots from this large pistol and simply walked away and then ran like hell. Unmasked? Unmasked, yes. And then, I mean, girls, two girls that I knew saw me running away with a pistol and a friend. And I was mightily impressed that they'd seen me because it, it gave me a bit of a boost. I mean, it was an ego trip uh, as well. The army got tougher. A Doherty and a friend called Eamon Lafferty were taking it in turns to keep watch. It was time for a Doherty to take a rest. We had heard that during the night the army were going to try and come into the area. So I fell asleep in a chair and within about an hour I was wakened by a, a close friend to be told that Eamon had just been shot dead. Eamon Lafferty was killed on the 18th of August 1971, the first IRA man in Derry to be shot dead by the army. He was 19 when he died. I was most disappointed along with others that in the huge funeral that Eamon got, outsiders came in to do a colour party and we, the people who had operated with them, were pushed to the side. And other people were, we thought, trying to exploit his death and his funeral. I also found that a lot of people then volunteered to join the IRA with his funeral. It just became flooded, and my central role was diminished, and I was not happy about that. So I simply drifted away from the IRA for about six months. Um, I just didn't attend anymore. As a Doherty became disillusioned, his friend became a martyr for the cause. By the beginning of 1972, a Doherty was effectively out of the IRA. One Sunday that January, he was one of thousands who joined a civil rights march in Derry. This was the beginning of what became known as Bloody Sunday. Uh, the first shots being fired, we heard screams, total panic broke out. Everybody began running. shooting going on uh, all around me, um, couldn't understand it. Knew that the IRA's policy was not to uh, be anywhere near the front line when the civil rights demonstrations were on the go. Um, while we were running, myself and my, uh, my friend got separated. There were thousands of people lying on the ground screaming and shouting. And it was obvious that people had been shot. That afternoon, paratroopers shot dead 13 unarmed civilians, half of them under 19. 
the army said they'd come under fire. Eyewitnesses said they had not. When I could not find my friend, when things began to cool down, I presumed he had been shot dead. His brother was a Roman Catholic priest, and uh, he and I got into his Volkswagen car and drove across the bridge to the water side. But we got through the various army barricades because of his, his priestly identification. And I got right to the door of the morgue in Alton McGovern Hospital with the priest. He went in to look at the bodies. I would not go in. There were top army officers and policemen um, standing outside the morgue, smiling happily, obviously under the impression that they had shot dead terrorists or IRA men on Bloody Sunday, whereas they hadn't they shot civilians. And I was standing there, I saw the families being brought in by their sons or daughters. I saw the wives being brought in, or mothers. I saw them go past into the morgue to check the bodies of people who an hour before had been alive. I saw them come out. And I thought, you know, to myself that, Shane, you've drifted away from the IRA for five or six months. And if it of people because you're not centrally involved, now is the time to go back and to get centrally involved all over again, which I did do. And uh, Bloody Sunday had that effect. Bloody Sunday rekindled in most Irish Catholics that deep-seated hostility for British soldiers that have been handed down generation to generation since the days of Cromwell. Scores of young people cross the border into the beautiful fastness of Donegal to train for attacks on the British presence. To most Catholics, the border is merely a line on a foreign map so when Shane Paul O'Doherty went on the run in Donegal, it was no problem for his family to go over and visit. At a later point, I did meet him now and then in Donegal when I was aware that he was involved, and I told him that, he, you know, I gave the arguments that I don't think that he should have been involved in the IRA and that violence doesn't solve anything, that it's got to be people by their own minds deciding to change things, not by bombs. I told him violence would never work, and he argued fanatically against me at the time. There was a fanaticism in his eyes when he was arguing with me. But what can you do with uh, impetuous youth? And he was the unfortunate member of the family who happened to be around uh, after Bloody Sunday or whatever. Uh, and I have no doubt at all that if I had been around uh, in Bloody, during Bloody Sunday, that I would probably have got involved as well. That's the unfortunate thing of it. In 1973, a Doherty heard that his father had cancer. Father then got terminally ill immediately after that. And they didn't see Shane then until father's funeral. Shane was taken once to see him from Dublin, as far as I, I heard that. And he wept all the way in and out. And he did never see him again until the morning of his father's funeral. That he came into the cathedral, sat beside me, I couldn't believe it. He was sort of smuggled in. He suddenly turned up beside me carrying the coffin with a with dyed hair. Uh, I had a few dyed hair. Dyed hair, yes, yes. He he was disguised, heavily disguised, and he didn't at all look like the young man that I had known before he left home. He has red hair. It was black. Um, they he had they had somehow grayed his face so that he looked about in his late twenties rather than his late teens, you know. And uh, they had put padding into his shoulders again and. He, did, he didn't look at all like the person I knew. And it must have fooled the security forces as well. We walked the, the, the coffin to the, the graveyard. I had a few words with him. And he, anything I asked him which bordered on his possible activities, he told me to shut up. So I just kept it to pleasantries. And... The funeral over, Shane Paul O'Doherty went back to bombing and Derry paid the price. I mean, I made up bombs that were maybe 500 pounds to go into um, vans to be smuggled into city centres. And when you were working with bombs, I mean, only maybe three or four of us would often be in that role in the city because no one else wanted it. But when you're standing beside a 500 pound bomb, you are quite nervous. You also may be suffering from a severe gelignite headache. And you know that you are the most um, expendable of all. And often when you were making bombs, no one else was around be because of the danger of explosion. But that gave a certain status as well because um, you were taking a lot of risks with this gear. 
I happened to be in Bonkrana, which is the nearest town over the border, and which I suppose was where IRA men sort of hung out. And uh, I happened to bump into him in a pub there. I was about to get married. Uh, I didn't. I had no close friend that I could call upon. So I said, Shane, by the way, um, would you like to be my best man at my wedding at Letterkenny Cathedral in, in April? Oh, he said, I'd love to. And um, I had my wife to be Eileen with me. And we had a lovely evening in, in a pub there. And my wife-to-be didn't know at the time that he was involved. And she said, oh, what a charming young man. I didn't know you had a bro such a lovely brother as that. I said, yes, I have. And she said, what does he do? I said, I don't know he does this and that. <laughs> didn't you have any inhibitions about having an IRA man as your best man? Well, it was all happening over the border. And the security forces over the border didn't seem to mind about it. So it, it didn't trouble me. He was my brother and I loved him, you know. In 1973, while O'Doherty was on the run, the IRA bombed London for the first time. One man was killed and 180 injured. The bombers were arrested as they tried to leave the country. Among them were the Price sisters. To keep its grip on the headlines and to protect its units, the IRA decided to send the next wave of bombs by post. Number 10 Downing Street was one of the targets. Many were injured. The architect of the letter bomb campaign was Shane Paul O'Doherty. It was the belief of the people engaged in explosives in the IRA that they were a good device for publicity, achieving world publicity for no outlay whatsoever. The Price sisters and others had been arrested in London after one bombing operation, whereas letter bombs ran for months, no arrests, um, major publicity and propaganda. The world's eyes were on London that, that, that summer. There were so many bombs, sorters refused to handle the mail, so police did the job for them. Secretaries and security men had been seriously injured, and postmen didn't want to be next. One of the recipients was Brigadier Michael O'Cock. As soon as I started to open it, I just tore the top open. I could see it was a small paperback, a very thin paperback book. Uh, but what made me slightly suspicious was it had a bit of sellotape over the top of it. And I just began to draw it out when I could realise, and, and immediately I then recognised it was a letter bomb. And so I, I pushed it under the sofa which I was sitting on, like this, and got up to go away. And as I did so, it went off. And I suppose my hand was only about a foot or two away from it at the time. Uh, and uh, uh, I was very lucky I w got away as I did, because in fact, when I looked back, there was a great hole straight through the bottom of the sofa uh, wh where I'd been sitting. And so um, that wouldn't have been too pleasant. But um, um, that was really all I could do about it at that stage. Was it a large explosion? Well, it made a hell of a bang, yes. It made a terrific bang. And in fact, um, I, I looked at my hand, which of course was a complete sort of bloody mess, and uh, I, I could see straight away that the end of my thumb had gone, and incidentally it was never found again. It, it was blown to bits, I suppose. And this first finger was peeled back like a banana. It was uh, like it was, uh, all, all the skin had come back like that. There was a white wall just behind me which was splashed with blood. Former Home Secretary Reginald Maudling was O'Doherty's highest-ranking victim. He was lucky to escape with minor injuries. When he opened the letter bomb at his country home and had his thumb injured and the table injured, it wasn't a case that he was injured or killed because they were mostly, it seemed, publicity devices. They, they took the whole world's attention to London and to the IRA letter Yeah, but they campaign. were also lethal. I mean, they contained enough explosives to kill somebody. There was a Bible with nails inside mm -hmm. and explosives. That's they right. could have killed people. It was a miracle well, they didn't. I would agree with you that there was a possibility that any of those devices could have killed, but you must remember that to a person who had been in the IRA for some years, whose life was on the line every day of the week, who had known a lot of people who were killed or had sacrificed their lives, the idea that Reginald Modling might be killed, or that a bomb going to 10 down the street, or to a brigadier. But, but innocent civilians were injured. Secretaries Yes, that well, were, well this is uh, where... Secretary Clark right. lost right. her hand. Somebody well, else right. lost their fingers. Another person lost their eyesight. That's right. Well because of what you did. That was the reason. Well, obviously, um, there was no intent on my part to injure civilians. No, but you made the bombs. The bombs right. were posted and, and I'm not civilians denying I, were I'm not injured. denying that I made them and, and posted them. What I'm saying is that it was not my intent to hurt civilians. And when civilians were hurt, I regretted it. The provisionals escalated their London campaign by bringing terror to the underground. 
O'Doherty was responsible for the bomb that was planted at Baker Street Station in August 1973. Roman L. Milam saw a plastic bag with a Union Jack pattern um, on the floor outside Weston's chemist shop. Being a bit suspicious about this, he looked inside the bag. It was a clock attached to a battery by two wires and also 12 packets of a black substance which he considered to be an explosive. The bomb was the equivalent of 16 hand grenades. It was diffused just before it was due to explode after a Doherty had phoned a warning. Well, it occurred to me when um, I was arranging a code word with the Press Association in London, which would enable the police to tell real bomb warnings from, from, from hoax ones, that we were giving the security personnel um, the information they needed to defuse these things. Yes, you took risks. But there was but always the risk that the message wouldn't get through or wouldn't be believed or something would go wrong or the bomb would go off prematurely and dozens of innocent civilians, passengers on the underground system, could have been wiped out by a bomb that you made. Yes, well, I mean, I would state categorically that any bombings that I was associated with uh, of the uh, hold all type or other uh, telephone warnings using a code word were offered on every occasion. Um, to the press association. At the beginning of 1975, the IRA declared a ceasefire and a Doherty came home to Derry on the understanding that arrests were unlikely unless volunteers were caught red-handed. But he didn't know that the police had already traced his handwriting and his fingerprints. And then he came home. He said, you know, that said the treasure drop, there'll be peace now, which we all thought. And he was only home about a week when the special branch arrested him. And I had changed and bought the bungalow. He was out doing the lawn. Nothing but a beautiful day, nothing but his jeans on. And they arrested Shane that day. What did the policeman say to you? Sergeant Galbraith. I said, what, you know, is the meaning of this? I thought there was a truce. And Shane was taken off. And he took me in and put me down on the couch. He said, now, I know you, I know all your people, I knew your husband. He said, they're just taking Shane in for questioning. Don't worry about it. He's not home by six o'clock. You know, just give us a ring. When I phoned at six o'clock, Shane wasn't getting out. How did you uh, react when you discovered that Shane had been arrested? Uh, relief. Relief. Because there's two ways, as far as I know, there are two ways out of the IRA. Uh, you either come out as having been shot to death in, a, in an act of service, or you come out as taken into prison. And I was relieved, although sad that he was arrested, but relieved because it meant that he, might, he was likely to survive the whole business, you know? Next I heard from Shane, he was in Castlebury. And from there by jet to London. And they let me talk to him on the phone, my own phone, from wherever he was in London. He said, I'm all right, don't worry about me. But he wasn't abused or anything like that. I mean, Shane was really fortunate. Shane was never abused or anything. <laughs> Two days after O'Doherty's arrest, the provisionals shot dead Constable Paul Gray in retaliation for what they claimed was a breach of the ceasefire. Protestant paramilitaries were rumoured to be planning revenge against the O'Doherty family. I had been teaching in a Protestant school. In Derry? Uh, in Derry, in the, the old London Derry High School. I was newly married. We had just, we were settling down into our home. And the head of my department in the school came to me that afternoon and he said, Eamon, I'd advise you, son, to get the hell out of here because it's possible that the UVF or somebody else will, will, will be wanting to, to shoot you, you know. So that night we, we packed our bags. Uh, my wife was two months off for our first child and uh, we, we just went to Dublin to his relatives there and stayed there. <laughs> that was it, a uh, teaching career, mortgage, uh, my, my home where, I, I, where I, I loved, a lovely job, I loved teaching there, all gone, yes. After Dublin, Eamon went to live in England. In September 1976, Adoherty's trial began at the Old Bailey. Nothing was left to chance. 
In the van, it now emerged, was the man who was one of the IRA's top bombers in London. A Doherty refused to recognise the court. It was only during the course of the trial that his family realised what he had done. I was very horrified, very sick, shattered, and uh, that um, people were being badly hurt and injured uh, over uh, a cause which had, for 800 years, been bedeviling Ireland and England. And I was very sad that Shane had pressed the buttons on those bombs, yes. And when you discovered that he was responsible for the bomb that was planted in Baker Street Underground Station? Again, horrified and very sad and ashamed, yes. Ashamed? Think, yes. Did you feel ashamed because you were his brother or ashamed as a Catholic? Ashamed on every, on every known parameter, every known human cause, because that could have killed any innocent people. And, I, I, I mean, I'm a very, very peaceful fellow, you know, and um, I'm also a devout Roman Catholic, and they just don't square up, you see. I couldn't believe it, as, as I say, that uh, one of the things he had done, not only the letter bombs, one of the things he had done was to have left uh, a bomb at Baker Street Station, which was a, a tube station which I used. Apart from that, the fact that I had a lot of English friends at the time who, you know, and just the thought that anybody connected me could have brought such mayhem to London was just unthinkable. I just couldn't believe it. I was disappointed in him. I was very angry at him. I was angry at him for putting myself through this and putting my mother through this because it really hit her harder, I think. Um, I thought that for someone to go out and letter bomb people indiscriminately was a terrible and dastardly thing to do, and he was a son of a bitch to do it, and so I had no sympathy for him whatsoever. None whatsoever. But he's your brother. I realize that fully, but uh, even in the Civil War in America, they had brother against brother for the very same reason. Um, I'm totally opposed to violence and always will be and always have been. And here he was in the midst of it, blowing people away. And, and I didn't like it in the least. The revelations at the trial finally shattered the family. Bernard was in America where he'd become a successful businessman. Fogel was to join him. Eamon was in England, Murdoch was in Lancashire, and Shane was soon to be in Wormwood Scrubs, starting 30 life sentences. Every month for the next nine years, Sadie travelled the 500 miles from Derry to London to visit her son. sit there at night and think, you know, what the heck am I doing here? With all my family and here I am alone in London tonight. It used to make me feel so lonely until I would go into the prison in the morning. From Victoria right out to East Acton, change it, Oxford Circus. I knew every part of that so well. To Wormwood Scrubs? To Wormwood Scrubs. And you got a cup of tea there and all. And the staff were nice, I must say that. And Shane was so thrilled to see me. I remember coming and I'd be in tears coming outside, you know, when I would come outside. I remember, you know, standing there shedding tears, thinking, my God, what's this come to, you know? To me rearing all that family and here I am. But he was inside but doing his time because he sent letter bombs. He, ne he never resented that, though. You know, you, he deserved what he got. You never heard Jane complain about that. He said, I prefer to do it in this world. Within a week of his conviction, a Doherty was refusing to wear prison uniform on the grounds that he wasn't a criminal. He spent 14 months in solitary confinement, naked except for his prison blanket. His protest lasted through 1977, and then came what appeared to be the beginning of a remarkable conversion. But it was seven years before the authorities finally believed that he might have changed. I read Quaker pamphlets on peace and justice. I studied everything I could get my hands on. And I came inescapably to the conclusion that injuring people, taking people's lives, was a means only of creating injustice. It did not create a just society in Ireland. It created a society of massive injustice. We became part of the problem. For instance, um, one of our central objects was to do away with the border. Well, in the IRA campaign, as far as I could see, uh, upon reflection, we extended the border 
from around the six counties, right up through the six counties, through housing estates, through streets. We polarised the communities. We broke the Protestant and Catholic communities completely apart. We have created permanent borders throughout Northern Ireland, a hundred borders that were never there before. In 1978, O'Doherty made his repentance public. Back home in Derry, the local press announced that one of its most notorious sons had repented. By 1980, O'Doherty had finally persuaded the authorities to let him write and apologise to his victims. As far as I personally was concerned, uh, the two main features of his letter were that first, uh, it was, uh, he didn't really know who I was, it was just because I was holding a certain job. And second, that he didn't mean to kill me, that he only meant to injure me. Well, that didn't sound awfully nice, so I wasn't terribly impressed, quite honestly, by his apology. Other victims, the civilians he'd maimed, were even less impressed. The apology cut no ice. The family of one said he should rot in hell. It didn't really concern me if people unknown to me didn't believe it. I mean, I made a decision to volunteer my services to the IRA, and I made a decision to cease to volunteer my services to the IRA. I was immediately suspicious, only because of the backdrop. If it looks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it is a duck. And so all my life I'd known from his uh, school and college that here he was involved in this stuff. And um, all of a sudden there's a 180 degree turnaround. And so I was suspicious. He never ever, that to my knowledge, did things by halves. When he was in the provisional IRA, uh, he was, I gather, the explosives officer for the whole of Derry City, which means he threw himself fully into that. So when he said he was out, coming out, he had had enough of violence and he was coming across to Christian pacifism, I instinctively believed him, but that was another matter to get the authorities to believe that, you see. I have effectively left it. Everybody who knows anything about the Irish situation, politicians, churchmen or media people, would accept that I've simply left the IRA and that's it. In 1985, after years of protesting, a Doherty was finally transferred to Northern Ireland, to the Mays prison. was the most marvellous day of my life when I got that phone call. And the prison authorities phoned me and told me she would be there. And I'd have free visit. Just go straight up. That was a wonderful, wonderful day of my life. Shane and Irish soil again. Wonderful. O'Doherty is now in the province's new prison at McGabry. McGabry is a very different sort of top security prison. One of its jobs is to prepare former Republican and Loyalist paramilitaries for possible release. Inside, the two sides rub shoulders. Many, like Adoherty, claim to have rejected the past. But the vast majority of IRA prisoners do not repent. Adoherty is the exception. I, I think. He's not typical, but I think his proportion is growing from what I see in the, in the prison that I visit, Macabre prison, uh, where you see Protestant and Catholic prisoners there. And it looks to me, and from what Shane says, like a, an atmosphere of people trying to get some sort of understanding and trying to come through and, and improve what has happened over the last 20 years. The only possibility, it lies outside Shane's hands, it lies in people accepting that there was a war, that it was a bitter war, a hard and a savage war, but that the sooner it ends, the better, and the sooner the people try to work through some sort of democratic process, accept the wrongs that they did in the past. It might sound idealistic, but I don't see why our problem can't be solved by people giving up the armed struggle and trying for a better Ireland. Let's just forget the things that happened from 1600 to 1700 or 1800, but they can't even forget that. They remember things like throwing hot oatmeal over the redcoats in Galway and Connemara as vividly as it, if it were yesterday. And uh, I'm not into that, you know. Let's try and remember the future. O'Doherty has spent 15 of the past 20 years in jail. He's the only brother left in Northern Ireland, and that's because he's locked up. Because of the distance involved, visits can be rare. 
but the mark on the family is indelible. I have a special relationship with Shane since I'm his younger brother and I've always looked up to him very much. And so I've always taken a trip back here once in a while to see him. I always felt from the day he joined the IRA and was uh, parading around Derry like with the other guys that, wow, you know, he's a hero and, and I'm just a wimp, you know, I'm, I'm not getting involved. I'm not really a man and he really is a man, you know, that kind of thing. I sit in, you know, in New York, sometimes I see the news and I hear about something going on here that's bad, some violence or something, and I really immediately feel a surge of guilt coming up. I go, oh my God, what do I do now, you know? And I feel very guilty, in fact, about him being there and me living a life which is as good as it could be. The cost has been incalculable to us as a family. I mean, it's all very well uh, singing Republican songs like Kevin Barry and um, A Nation Once Again and The Patriot Game, and you put your martyrs up and, and you have pints of Guinness around them. But when you see the effect that it has on your w widowed mother, see the effect on my own family that I am, well, I'm a reasonably happy exile in England, but really I'm a reluctant one. I'd much rather have gone on teaching in Derry. Um, and there's, I, I think, if what happened to us serves as a warning to others, for God's sake, uh, uh, don't get involved in these things because it's not worth the candle. And I don't think any cause is, is advanced one iota uh, by the sending of bombs, by the letting off of, of, of firearms, uh, by these die for errand speeches, because at the end of the day, you have broken families, uh, many graves. Um, I, I could get quite emotional about it, frankly. So all this has come to us. Sad, sorrowful years. I won't see the end of it, but I hope my children will. And I pray and hope for that day. They'll be all friends again. And the younger generation will pick up the pieces. And they'll become friends. O'Doherty is one of 16 lifers who've just been given release dates. The one-time volunteer will now go to university. Did you help free Ireland? No, I think we have done a disservice to the ideals we sought to serve. We were possessed by the idea of the blood sacrifice and the armed struggle. It possessed us. And um, you only have to look at the state of Northern Ireland now to, to see that, that the fruits of 20 years of violence have put off the very ideals we sought to serve and will do so for a long time to come.